ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Before we commence this special event today, I'd like to, on your behalf, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. My name is Veronica Taylor. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific here at the ANU. And today, on behalf of our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome uh, to the Australian National University uh, the Coordinating Minister for Security, Law and Political Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, Retired General Luhut Finzal Pajayika. You're very most welcome to you. I'd also like to welcome uh, and acknowledge uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Jeep. Uh, Najib Rihat Kasuma, the Indonesian ambassador to Australia, and uh, also acknowledge and welcome uh, the Consul General for Indonesia in Sydney, uh, Mr. Yayan uh, Gamba Hayat Moyana. Pat Luhut is accompanied on this visit to Australia by a very distinguished delegation of Indonesia's most important law, security, and political policymakers and advisors. And so to all of those distinguished members of the delegation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to you from uh, our Vice-Chancellor and from colleagues here at the University. Representing ANU, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Associate Professor Frank Yotso, who is here as the Acting Director of the Crawford School of Public Policy, which is where we meet today. Um, Dr. Arianto Pantunu, uh, representing the ANU Indonesia Project. Uh, Ms. Marina Tsurvis, who is the Senior Executive Advisor to the National Security College here at ANU. And Associate Professor Greg Feely. Uh, who is the head of the Department of Political and Social Change uh, here in the College of Asia and the Pacific and the Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. Um, Greg has kindly agreed to moderate the uh, question session uh, following the remarks uh, from Park Luther. It's my pleasure now to uh, formally uh, introduce Park Luther as our speaker today. Uh, he is uh, well known to many of you. Since uh, August 2015, he has been the Coordinating Minister for Political, Legal and Security Affairs in Indonesia, but was previously Presidential Chief of Staff to President Joko Widodo from October 2014. His previous uh, appointments include Minister of Trade and Industry for Indonesia during President Abdurrahman Wahid's administration, and also uh, service as ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to Singapore during the crucial era of reformasi from 1999 to 2000. Pat Lupert has a, a very distinguished military career uh, that preceded his government service uh, and has held various battlefield and important positions uh, from commander of Group 3 Kopassus, commander of infantry <coughs> weaponry, and commander of army education and training. After retiring from the military, uh, he founded Toba Sejatra Group, which is a fast-growing group uh, with three core activities, natural resources, electricity generation, and agriculture. As a four-star general, uh, he has experience in the military, diplomacy, government, business, and in what he now defines as the most important field, social development. And it's in that field um, that he also serves as chairman of the Yale Foundation, which has created schools, including technology, college, and privileged students, a bilingual high school for gifted children, a kindergarten, and an elementary school. And in this capacity, in 2011, Pat Luhut received Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award in the social development category. As his profile makes clear, he is an extraordinarily accomplished Indonesian leader and a policy maker of profound influence. Pat Lugut, thank you for making time in your schedule to be with us here at ANU. Today, I believe, is your first visit to the university. And we sincerely hope that it will be the first of many. We're privileged to hear from you today, and so I now invite you to the podium to address us on the topic of solving security issues in Indonesia. Thank 
Professor Veronica, thank you very much. Such a very generous introduction. I feel uncomfortable with that uh, introduction because she put me so look so good when I'm not with you. Yeah, I spent like uh, 22 years in uh, Special Forces, so that's why I'm not look very good. Because uh, I've been trained in the U.S. Uh, Special Forces and I also been trained in uh, British uh, SIS. And then I joined also uh, GSG-9 training in Handler in Germany. So I'm an uh, instructor in the many fields in the military, especially in the Special Forces. So sometimes I ask myself why I'm to be here like this. So, because I'm going to brief you a lot of things, not only about the security, but I'm going also to brief you about what happened in Indonesia, about the economy, and some other things. So, I hope that I can, uh, you know, uh, give a comprehensive briefing this, this afternoon. But uh, with me also, uh, I accompany with the Indonesian National Chief of Police, General IT. is uh, uh, Admiral uh, Didi, is the uh, Chief Staff of the uh, And General Tito is a uh, rising star of the police. <laughs> also, my young fellow here uh, who prepare all this material. So it is good, look good that because of that. There's a set up. Baya, he's economic, a PhD from Blue. Uh, and here also uh, Edo, this is uh, Edo, he's also a PhD from Oxford University, uh, scholarship, so all to get scholarship, so they are very smart. Right? I'm okay, like this. <laughs> so I try to be and look smart, but uh, basically, this is the team right now in my uh, ministry. I have around 10 young chap basically helping me to prepare all this thing, to do some research in order to, you know, give the best of the best to my country. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin with the key social and economic challenges in Indonesia. If you look at now uh, this, this slide, you see we are talking about the uh, quality economic growth. Uh, and then we are talking also narrowing uh, income gap and creation job opportunity and also affordable food uh, price. This is actually the first day that when the President Joko Wibi was in the office, we discussed it very much. So, if you don't have a good uh, uh, the gap, I mean, if you still uh, bring the gap like uh, big like this, it's going to be create some instability in the near future. So that's why we are talking, not only talking about growth, we are talking also equality. Equality, I think, is very important in Indonesia because this is like a two sides of the coin. You are talking about economy, at the same time, you're talking also about security. So, since I understand a little bit about economy and understand a lot about security, I always put this together when I give my speech and everywhere I go. Job opportunity, of course, you have to create a you know kind of project in order to uh, create job opportunity in Indonesia. That's why, if you look at also the, the what do you call it, the infrastructure project, this creates job opportunity. Last year, 2.1 million was successful to add. Uh, number of uh, opportunity in Indonesia. So I think it's moving uh, uh, quite uh, quite good. Now affordable food price. This is another issue in Indonesia right now. We understand fully that the food price in Indonesia is still very high compared to the ASEAN countries in Indonesia. Now we understand why. We understand that some, so many middlemen within the within the food supply. Food supply. I give an example like uh, like uh, you know rice, cattle, you name it. While we have enough, basically, rice, we have enough uh, uh, chili. You know, we're talking about chili, you know. Even though I'm first of general, we're talking about chili. Because without chili, <laughs> going to create another problem in Indonesia. Maybe here chili is not a big deal, but over there, chili is a big deal. So the, we touch also a very essential thing in order to satisfy our people, because this is our cause, impact directly toward our inflation. So we are doing this uh, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, besides that, I think we are, uh, we are also talking about the, 
the drugs and narcotic uh, uh, abuses. This is one of the very, uh, uh, very potential threat. Uh, I should say like this. This is one of the biggest enemy right now in the Indonesia. Because you look at now, you understand like 5.9 million people of Indonesia linked to the uh, drugs last year. This is recorded. We don't know how much unrecorded. So the drugs issue in Indonesia become a big problem. Terrorists, yes, one issue. But this one, if you ask me, personally I said this one even much bigger issue in Indonesia than terrorism. Why? Every day, 30 to 50 people get killed in Indonesia because of their drugs. Everywhere, across the board. They don't care whether you are Christian or you are Hindu, Islam, you name it. They don't care. They don't care whether you are uneducated. They don't care whether you are in the church area. You don't care whether you are in Pasantra. Everywhere. They penetrate. If you look at the data here, 13%, 13.5%, 2015, the highest in the last five years. That's not a problem. So with this data here, we are really concerned. Really concerned about this. So now we work very hard. The president give much attention on this. Look at also the other data on the, the, on the drugs issue. Look at the ecstasy. Ecstasy and also the, you know, uh, respectively the 350% and 250%. Who consume this one? this uh, material, people of Indonesia, who they are, they don't care who you are. This data is very dangerous for us. So we work very hard right now to tackle this one, because this also related to the HIV issue. If you look at now HIV issue, uh, next slide. Yeah, maybe. HIV issue. This is also linked very much. So, that uh, is, because injection. Now look at the map of Indonesia, mapping Indonesia, look at the Papua. Papua right now, 2.4% linked to the, to the HIV. West Papua, here, 3.2%. This is already very dangerous. In Jakarta, 1.03%. So we are thinking now, we have a big problem in Indonesia. We have to solve this one. The problem, the border of Indonesia, the sea coastline is huge. <coughs> How do you protect this one? So we are talking a lot of problems in Indonesia that we have to face. But I can tell you, we work very hard, and I believe that we can minimize and we can reduce this one within a couple of years ahead. Now let me move to the threat, terrorist threat. Terrorist threat is one issue also that are very uh, much uh, radicalism and terrorism. Uh, this is also economic determinant. If you look at this one, this above the, you know, the, the, the what do you call it, this is iceberg. Basically, we are quite successful to manage. I think General Tito, or the Chief Police, but General Haiti, we have quite complete data today. We can monitor all the activities of them. I can assure you. But I, I cannot say that we are immune from the terrorist attack, but I can assure you, that we have a quite complete data on this right now. Like yesterday, General uh, Haiti told me like three weeks ago, but we have a kind movement over there. I think we plan to arrest. And they arrested yesterday, three of them. So we can monitor. So we have a quite complete data right now. Our cooperation with Australia also very good. We exchange data with Australia, with our neighbor also very good. So then we can reduce this kind of, uh, kind of, uh, a threat. Ladies and gentlemen, unemployment also is one problem. Um, slide before, yeah. Yeah, this unemployment and income uh, inequality and poverty. This is, we believe, also topics or uh, possibility or maybe impact, uh, very close impact toward uh, radicalism. In so that's why, if you look at also the program of government in Indonesia, we also give attention equality. I can touch this issue later on about Dana Desa, the fund, uh, 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 the village fund, which is, I think, very important. Maybe in, in Australia it's not much, it's not very important, but in Indonesia this is very important. We have 74,752 villages around the country. 
so you can imagine diversity of this this village. So if you bring some uh, some uh, equality to this uh, economic activities over there, we believe could reduce any uh, terrorist uh, uh, issue. Income equality also a problem. We like also to reduce more uh, you know uh, ownership. Uh, too much sometimes uh, land uh, control by some uh, big con conglomerate, three million hectares, two million hectares, five hundred thousand hectares is too much. So we have to allocate also what we call it uh, uh, plasma. Plasma by law they have to get thirty percent. The problem in Indonesia before and today some still because we have a law, we have a regulation, but uh, we don't. Uh, implement this law and regulation as is. We try to, you know, to adjust, which is, I think, immediately impact toward the poor people, benefit to the rich people. So right now, we like to see. Don't get me wrong. We are not going to be the communists or to be a, to be a socialist. But equality, I think, is very important for the people of Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, poverty rates in cities also and fields in Indonesia have gone down, but the gap. <laughs> Still like this. Look at the uh, uh, city and desa and village, like this. Something wrong with this. We have to. We want to see the gap narrowing in the near future. So that's why the dana desa also very important in order to make down this uh, the, the gap like this. Otherwise, we're going to see only in the big, big city people enjoy the fruit of this democracy or the fruit of this economy. But we like also to see the people in the village enjoy also the fruit of our economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, income inequality has gone up. Look at the data like this. Since uh, 2000, 2008, look at now the coefficient Gini is up only 0 0.35. But then the last time, the last, uh, last uh, uh, 2011 and till 2015, already 0 point, uh, 0 0.41. So last year, already 0. 40. Why? We found out that Dada Desa is really impact toward this uh, Gini ratio, which is a thing good. Infrastructure impact also to this. So then we believe that we have to move, uh, make it more effective. How do we disperse the budget for the Dana Desa? The program of uh, infrastructure. I will show you later on about this program. Quality of human capital and demographic bonus also is something very important. If you look at also this one, demographic bonus uh, can only be uh, maxim uh, maximized uh, in increase human capital. We understand also quality of education in Indonesia, especially outside of Java, much less than in Java, especially on technology. Right now, the government boosts very much. The quality of education out of Java has to be gone up near, uh, closer to what happened in Java. So, if Australian government, if I, I discussed yesterday when during our uh, bilateral meeting with uh, uh, Attorney General uh, George, uh, George uh, Randis, I said to him, but George, if you want to help Indonesia, I think provide education, not only in Java, and, and you and Australian National University, I think very well known, top eight in the world, but don't go to only to Java, you go only to the big university in Java. They have enough. <laughs> now thinking about Papua, thinking about Makassar, thinking about Ambon. You can do a lot over there. Because this is, I think, the problem. Otherwise, Indonesia is going to be uh, going to uh, face a lot of problems in the future. If you look at now, um, the uh, demographic bonus for Indonesia, around 60 to 70 percent, around 65 percent for the next 20 years. But if you don't educate this, um, this uh, young uh, young uh, people, it's going to be backfire later on for Indonesia. So that's why I think, I'm, if I may appeal also to uh, an Australian National University, please consider to establish your cooperation with the uh, university outside of uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, non-economic factors, uh, political uh, repression, instability, and religious intolerance, I think this is an issue that we address very much. Uh, Country facing internal security crisis such as uh, Iraq. If you look at now in Iraq, in Middle East, we understand the situation over there. I discussed it also with some of my, my counterpart from Turkey, from uh, England, uh, British uh, MI6, and also with uh, the, the, the Russian uh, uh, 
uh, intelligent, and some other countries. Uh, the, uh, the conclusion of the, uh, the Middle East, you know, the situation in, in Syria is really unpredictable. The Shia Sunni fighting, and there are also the Hezbollah over there. Is a, a, there, are, there are ten groups over there. They fight each other. Now the Turkish over there, with Kurdistan. Now in the Saudi and Iran, the Shia Sunni nuclear bomb. Sometimes we don't understand. We don't understand what's going to happen. And I asked my counterpart, when going to be like this? The answer, we don't know. So why? Because you see, the situation over there is really chaotic. Now if you look at also economy around the world, you see the uh, the oil price still uh, remain around 40, 35 to 40. US dollar per barrel, so no more money. Look at now the first time in the history, Saudi is also deficit. So this kind of problem also add another ingredient of political instability in the Middle East. At the end, if you look at also the ISIS operation over there, also try to export their own Khilafah to uh, this area. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me move now to counterterrorism. Comprehensive and systematic action to counter terrorism and radicalism. This is, I think, the strategy of the government in Indonesia. There are two things, basically, hard approach and soft approach. But the government in Indonesia prefer to do soft approach, meaning that we have to, you know, uh, believe that uh, approach of this problem by using religion and culture, instead of doing hard approach. But it doesn't mean that we don't use the hard approach. Hard approach is the last option if you have to attack or you have to destroy or rescue hostages from the terrorist attack. So, we disagree on the proposal given by the, um, uh, the Saudis uh, maybe four or five months ago to join to the, you know, uh, what they call it, uh, military uh, uh, alliance. alliance. And I said, I, I advised to the president, but it's not right to join to Saudis to join this uh, military, military alliance uh, uh, against the uh, uh, ISIS. So better we still uh, keep our own uh, strategy using soft approach by promoting religion and uh, uh, culture to solve the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think finally we found out holistic approach to counter radicalism program. This is, I think, the best for us. So we believe religious, as I mentioned earlier, and psychologically, family, social, creative art, vocational training, education, uh, recreational sport. This is, I think, can help or can reduce the potential of uh, radicalism within the country. I'll give you an example, like I mentioned earlier. Yesterday, uh, General Tito arrested like three terrorists in, in Surabaya. Uh, I was informed by uh, uh, Haiti three weeks ago, they're going to do this. So. But the very interesting one, that those three uh, terrorists, they graduated from the, from the prison. Nusa Kambangan. Uh, so been trained. <laughs> yeah, been trained by their own uh, the hotline over there, the ideology over there. I give you example also another one. Uh, Tamrin incident, basically order given by uh, by uh, Oman Abdurrahman from from Nusa Kambangan to Raqqa, and from Raqqa to Burhan Nain to uh, who is the cat killer? Abu Ghraib. So can you imagine like this, you know? So right now, with the new strategy, we isolate them. No more communication. They are not allowed to have telephone, handphone in their jail. They are not allowed to do with their email anymore. Used to be, they can give. They can reach in. Today, they are not allowed. They are allowed to do their own, uh, no, uh, uh, solat. No, no, no forbidden on that. But they are not allowed anymore to, you know, to brainwash their own people or make them more even radical because we experienced that one. So we learn from our mistake, we learn from what happened our uh, uh, experience. So we believe that we can reduce this kind of uh, uh, threat in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also now classify uh, the, the, uh, the, the terrorists in Indonesia. There are three categories of the terrorists in Indonesia. Number one, Idolo. Number two is um, uh, what do you call it, uh, militants, and number four, supporters. This one, nearly nothing you can do. Because uh, I think Pak Tito told me, they try to bring 
the you know the ulama from Middle East, you know. and they don't want to see. It. They don't want to meet this. They, this, this guy they don't, they don't want, want to meet the, the, the ulama from Middle East. This one stay okay. Maybe we can still do something, but this one we can do a lot. But we don't want to see anymore. This one can talk directly to this and to this. So now we split. So the jail also, prison right now, we uh, define it for three categories. So we are thinking that we can minimize the impact of this. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me move now to policy responses like a village fund, revitalization of agriculture sector, which is, I think, very important for the people of Indonesia. Now, we first, let me go to the village fund. This is, I think, the priority of this uh, village fund. Maybe in Singapore, in in in, um, in Australia, this one is uh, it's not really very important because if you look at now in in Australia, I think the handicap between they have and they have not is very narrow. But Indonesia is very like this, the gap is big. So then the uh, the fund, uh, the allocation for the village funds for this, we are ready. Put it so we of course adjust to the any specific village in their own respective uh, province. Now, source of fund for this is like this. So last last year we give it like six hundred thousand US dollar per per village. Here small, but over there, ibu bapak, is a big deal. Ibu. Professor Veronica uh, is big deal. They don't know the funds uh, seven hundred million rupiah or six hundred thousand US dollar. This year, 900,000 uh, US dollar or 1.2 billion rupiah. Another big. This is another uh, 0.13, so increasing year to year. We have to manage this. How this fund can be used correctly by the, the, by the desa, by the village. Otherwise, maybe they use fund, uh, uh, fund for, to marry another <laughs> girl or what, you know, because <laughs> I'm allowed to marry this one, then go there and get it. So that's why we think, what's the best? And then we try to bring university also to be part of this program. So any university in that respectful area, we ask them to join. But it's not easy to do so, because not every day can be, you know, in that area. So then we think, oh, okay, we have a police, we have a military, what we call it, Babinsa, what we call it, Bakartimas. And then we talk to the chief police, we talk to the chief army, can you deploy them? together with the chief uh, uh, DESA to manage this fund or to control this fund. And it works. Next slide. If you look at, ladies and gentlemen, much of uh, budget allocation also for the, you know, for the agriculture, it is also very much. That's why I said the government would like to see uh, sustainability of agriculture. Agriculture is very important for Indonesia, but at the end, we need also to see not only the traditional uh, agriculture, we like to see also modernization of agriculture. That's why part of our discussion, uh, Professor Terenika, this yesterday, we like to see also Australia participation on this area. So if you can support the agriculture area, especially uh, outside of Java, I think could bring a lot of uh, benefit for the government in Indonesia. Now let me move to the infrastructure. This has never happened in the history of Indonesia. Uh, last year, we built 13 dams. This dam is a, is a round the country. This is very important. If you look at like uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur, Nusa Tenggara Barat. In Nusa Tenggara Timur, for instance, the government plan to build seven dams. Only one dam exists in the last uh, 72 years in Indonesian independence. Last year we built two. This year we built one, another one. So within five years, we came to build seven in, prison, uh, in uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur. Why in Nusa Tenggara Timur, water is very difficult. So when the water have enough, no more flood, no more uh, dry season because they still contain the water, and they have they create another 1,500 hectares of uh, paddy field. So same thing in the other area. And then they can also import uh, cattle from Australia. They can grow cattle over there. So make an economy movement. Not only that, we have to flash fund over there. Last year, like over 1 trillion rupiah. So you see the economic in Nusa Tenggara Timur right now, 
moving like this. It's very near to Australia. Then Australia also can be uh, part of this. Maybe the uh, Australian National University can do some research over there to see or to advise us, hey, your program is moving well or not. Something like this, maybe we can bring Indonesia and Australia closer and closer in the near future. This year, as I mentioned earlier, eight dams we built. And uh, you look at now the revitalization of the agriculture, the TNI and four. Yeah, that picture. This one. This is very important. Because in Kampung, this is also a big uh, debate in Jakarta. Ah, what happened with the TNI? They're going to be like before, you know, during the battle. No. We have the military in the desa, in the village. Why don't we assign them to work together with the village? They are very happy. Because we don't need to pay them. We <laughs> get paid already. And uh, they, they love it. And I asked uh, Seto to do kind of survey over there. Maybe you can talk from your uh, chair. Standing up. Yeah. I think uh, we did a survey to uh, Central Java uh, in area of Solo. Which is one of the main... Sources. It's not military yeah, or those shock heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then another one is in East Java. So what this Babinsa and the Babin Kapitnas do is basically they monitor the distribution of the government aid, such as the fertilizer. Uh, before there is so many uh, deviation in the fertilizer distribution, so the farmers cannot get enough uh, fertilizer right now. All the Babinsa <coughs> monitoring all the store that distribute the uh, fertilizer, uh, subsidized fertilizer, and with that they cannot play around anymore because they monitor. Uh, since the distribution from the uh, central government to the local government, local government to all the stores, they monitor the stock and they check again to the uh, farmers group whether they already get the allocation. So uh, all the farmers is, is very happy with the role of the Babin Kaptipnas and the Babinsa. Uh, besides the fertilizer, they also work also on the distribution of this tractor. Right now they drop the tractor to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, office of the army in the local province and then from that the Babinsa bring to the uh, the farmer house so there is no uh, a problem again with that oh after the president give the tractor they take it back somewhere there's, there's not, not, not that case anymore no. so with that I think they, they, they can uh, the other farmers is, is very happy and I think from this you can see the populari uh, popularity of the army is, is second highest compared to the uh, KPK. This is the survey from the Indobarometer in September 2015. So if you look at this one, then we prove it now. By get, getting this data, hey, then we deploy more. And I talk to the chief police. The chief police saw now so many also. Why don't we let them work together with the people over there? What's wrong with that? So some people say, oh, it's different with the Western. Okay, why don't you move to the Western country then? <laughs> <laughs> because this is the Indonesia. No? This is the situation over there. We need to fix this one. We don't have any uh, any order in our mind that we're going to do this to do that. The only thing we like to do it properly. We like to give this uh, this budget, this fund, moving within the village. We try as hard as possible that 80, 90 percent. If we can 100 percent, this money have to be in the village. So if the fund uh, moving within the village, I remember Professor Mubiarto from the Gajah Mada said. This could help our economy, and we understand. I think uh, Dr. Purbaya can explain what, how much impact on this sector toward our economy. It's a macroeconomy instead of me. You know, I'm military. Maybe I give you the wrong story. You know, let him. Just show me. So the impact of this village going to the economy is quite significant, not that big, but 0.2 to 0.4 percent in our estimation. It is good enough to create stability in the region. So this has to prove it to us that we move to the right direction. That's, I think, very important. Some people doesn't understand. They're just thinking, oh, this one, because Luhut Panjaitan is a military, they want to bring the military uh, style again. I, I, yes, I promise you, I bring the discipline, yes. But not the military um, like before, uh, Pa Anu, Pa Marcus. We are very friend, very frank. We just had a big fight over there. The next slide. Well, this is a style right now. The government very transparent, very open. But of course, some of our discussion cannot be publicly. You know, it's going to be oh, destroy the whole thing. Look, this is I think the government program implementation. Babinsa, the head village, and Bakantimas police. 
they were together, the universities. And we prove it so far, people happy. I don't care what some, some do of the observer. I care of the people. If the people are happy with this policy, move with this policy. That's, I think, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also move the competitiveness and infrastructure quality, which is, I think, very important. Indonesia has a problem with the efficiency. I told you earlier, uh, Indonesia, if you look at the logistic cost, it is very, very bad. Look at this one. It's like this. It's compared to Singapore, compared to Japan, like this, 4.9, while Indonesia, 14, or yeah, nearly, uh, sorry, Indonesia here, uh, there's uh, 14 uh, something. So we like to cut this one. This impact immediately toward uh, our economy to build more infrastructures. If you can look at now, I will uh, come again with the number. This is Japan. Why so efficient? You know? Why we don't? Again, discipline. Again, implementation. Again, still too much people enjoy with Enki Penki over there. We're going to minimize. That's the view to today. Example. President Jokowi gave a good example today. He's a humble president. He's a very clean, I should say. I tried to look at behind him whether something happened with him. I don't know, maybe he says so on his new business. There's nothing. His children, his wife, none. <coughs> only his son has one business, big business, Martaba. <laughs> <laughs> the only one, Martaba. Uh, sorry, pancake. Uh, sorry, maybe <laughs> you, Professor Veronica. You know. Only the Martaba. Now, variety of Martaba. And he's happy with that. So that is good. A good a give a good example to the people. And Ibu Negara, we call it Ibu Negara, Ibu uh, Madam uh, President. Still with the economic class. In the same scene always from Jakarta to Solo. And my daughter, here because her wife, uh, her husband is, uh, is a military command in, uh, in Solo. Yeah, coincidentally, coincidentally, many times, together with the same airplane with my with the Ibu Negara. And my daughter said, Dad, nothing changed there. I only two bodyguards. Never happened before. So give her to the people, hey, if Ibu Negara, the president, give a good example like this, hey, we have to follow. Although it cannot be like overnight solution, but I think this is the make the country moving much better today. And he's very firm. When you we give the example, we give the option. I always give the two options to the president, advantages, disadvantages, any option. And he asked me which one he prefer. I said this one better than this because of this is this. But finally it's up to you as a president. <coughs> Being in a military background, I always like this. That's the way we do it. Don't let him think too much, you know, the president, your boss or your commandant. Let them just see the two options or the most three options. Any option with advantageous, the advantageous, any option. So that's the president, very decisive. And he feel as long as the benefit for the people of Indonesia, Palu, we just move. That's good. So, yeah, we'll see Indonesia much better in the near future. Now, even the other infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen, look at this one. Next move, next slide. This is, I think, infrastructure project. Never happened before. Around the country. If you fly over Indonesia today, I think some of these uh, students also, you see the difference right now. Next slide. Yeah, this is a toll road in Java. And this is Sumatra. This is under construction. 2,700 kilometers. Never happened again in the history of Indonesia. This is uh, under construction right now. This. And this. And this. Across. This is the real reallocation re of the fuel subsidy. Ladies and gentlemen, the beauty of this also, uh, President, uh, when we started uh, this uh, uh, government back 2014, October, before the October, I mean, we discussed it before he officially uh, took office uh, to, uh, by October, then this, one, this issue has become a one part issue. Whether we're going to take out the subsidy or not. Because this is the burden of our uh, fiscal. So then we took it, this one, I think, immediately give a very uh, positive impact. You give uh, your runway, uh, advice on this, your premium on this. Yeah, Papaya, I pay your ticket, come over here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right after the winning of the election, we are thinking about removing the subsidy. But we realize that the short term impact will be quite negative. Usually the economy will slow down over the next three quarters after we 
tied to domestic fuel uh, prices. But uh, we realize that uh, the condition of the budget at that time is not enough to create a, a sustainable budget or to create a, a credible uh, uh, fiscal condition. So we had to do this despite of that uh, obstacle. Despite of that obstacle. But it is a measured decision. Uh, we know the hardship of the experience of the next uh, three quarters. And it, the economy is really slowing after that until the second quarter of uh, 2015. To remedy the conditions, to rectify the condition, the government expedited the infrastructure spending in the second half of last year. So, and we also uh, expedited the channeling of the fund for the poor and for for price for the poor. Basically, we maintain our price stability and we are making sure that uh, purchasing power and population is not distributed further. And after that, because of that, because of good policy responses in the second half of last year, our economy start to rebound it. And I think we can, I can say that we managed to create an early turn or turnaround in our economy down, uh, downturn. Theoretically, our, our business cycle can last over the next uh, seven years, basically. We have a second year expansion before another recession, like one year recession. And last uh, last time we started, uh, the, the, the last expansion was in 2009. So theoretically, our economy was about to fall into a recession sometime this year. But because of good policy response, I think we have created an uh, early turnaround. And because of that, our economy might go to expand for the next seven years, that is up to 2023. So I think the profit of the Asian economy is quite good because of good policy responses. Okay, uh, this is, I think, very important. Uh, you should see that 211 or around 20, uh, around 18 billion US dollars, uh, the subsidy, fuel subsidy, so we reallocate to this something like this. So, Never happened again in the history of Indonesia. For infrastructure, we allocated last year, I think, 393 rupiah. This is the first time. That's why we can build this, 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 and that. Sometimes we are so surprised. Because in Papua, for instance, the highland, when I was a, a captain, never happened like this. Right now, under construction road over there. It's around, uh, I don't know how many kilometers over there. Yeah. Next slide. Now, this is in Sumatra. Uh, this is in, in Jawa, I believe. So right now from, what do you call it, from uh, uh, Seram all the way down to Surabaya and to Banyuwangi. They have to complete this, um, this uh, toll road, toll road by 2018. Right now under construction. If you look at also, right now some of these are already done. This one uh, from, from what do I mean? Chirpon. Chipali. Chipali, all done. And you see the impact of this. Immediately the transportation cost goes down. Next slide. This is in, uh, sorry, not too fast. Yeah, this, this is, I think, the land confiscation. Always the issue of land confiscation in Indonesia. But with the new regulation, we appraise the land by independent appraisal. We give it 30% on top, and then we negotiate six, uh, 60 days. If you don't, you just put the money to the court, and we will lose. As long as this, for the public utilities, we don't mind. If you look at this data, showing that we move very fast. We still have problem. I'm not saying that uh, we don't have problem. You don't have problem when you go to the heaven. When you are still on earth, you're still facing a lot of problems. But you see significant, significant progress because of the policy and then because we are very poor. We told them as long as they benefit for the people of Indonesia, you have to respect this one. Because this regulation not only happening in Indonesia, but everywhere. This is a unique uh, common practice. Now let me also move to the other side in Kalimantan. Never happened again. I still remember when I, when I was active in the military. We like what we call a security belt. Basically, purpose of this, this is a border between Malaysia. We don't want the, you know, the, well, the border can be moved up and down. You know. So we want to fix this border. So then we build this one. This is under construction right now. You know what happened this one? Project IRR on the area like this is very low, below 10%. So never happened for me. So then I said to the president, Pak, why don't we just deploy the army engineer to do so? When they build like this, and then give it to the private sector, because the project IRR on this 
is going to be up. So it's moving now. So last year, 160 kilometers like this done by the Army Engineering. Now another 140 kilometers something this year, and all the way here 1,100 kilometers done. And this is the thing that are done by the by the private uh, company. Now let's move to the air, uh, improvement of air transportation capacity, which is I think very important in Indonesia, since they, in, Indonesia is the largest archipelago country. If you look at it like this, we are moving. You're going to be surprised to see a lot of better uh, infrastructure uh, airport right now in Indonesia. I give you one example like this. This is Wamena. Can you imagine Wamena? This is before. This is after. I think uh, I brought with me. Uh, for uh, Papones, the chief police of Papua, this General Paulus. Paulus. This outside. Uh, uh, and this is Ibu Lija. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ibu Lija, introduce who you are. My name is Lynn Maloali. I am an sec executive secretary of uh, NGO Local in Papua. Forum of NGO Local in Papua. We, are, we have an 110 local NGOs. <laughs> and number two is Epano. Yeah. My name is Matthew. Matthew Smoy, Human Rights Defender in Papua. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the last one, Matthew. Only two. Wow. So, I brought them, the reason I brought them because they're going to explain how do we handle about the human uh, right issue in Papua. I'm going to solve this one. By end of this year, it to be solved. Why? We make a lot of mistakes over there. I'm not saying that we don't make a, we don't make any mistake over there. We still make a lot, a lot of mistakes. But I can tell you, I promise you, we improve our mistakes. We, if necessary, bring them to the, uh, to the court. Bring them to the court. Why? They're a human being. They maybe some make some mistake. So that's I think the solution. We don't want to hide something behind. This is very transparent in the world today. Now, construction re uh, and re revitalization of seaport. This one is very important for Indonesia. We're moving because, as I mentioned earlier to you, 30 million US dollar, 32 million US dollar per year. We are located right now for the budget uh, for the infrastructure uh, construction in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, also we improve the business climate, creating one-stop services, which is I think very important. Electricity used to be 900 something days, right now 250. Uh, six days. I still remember two months ago, the Coordinating Board of Investment in Indonesia reported to the President, Mr. President, in the Cabinet meeting, we are supposed to cut down to this, and Mr. President said, oh yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I speak in Bahasa. Tapi lain kali jangan laporan sama saya kalau masih uh, 300 hari. <laughs> Next time, not report to me, it's still a triple digit, you know. Report to me when they are the double digit. So, why? Because in Australia you can do it double digit, in Singapore you can. Why you can do it in Indonesia? What's the problem? The president cut, cut, make it simple. Don't make it complicated. Basically, we make the problem complicated because we like to see the complication. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now let me move to the uh, Papua special economy uh, and rational and objective of this one. If you look at this one, this is, I think, the basic thing. Papua is very unique provinces in Indonesia. There are two provinces in Papua. You see, the only province in Indonesia, 98%, if not 100%, the provinces and the kabupaten lead by the Papuanis. Am I right, Ibu? Yes, yes, you are Standing right. Standing please, Yes, Pak Luhut's right. <laughs> 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 Don't get me wrong because I pay her ticket, that's it. <laughs> so, this is the objective of such a special autonomy. This one very clear. You can read this one. The, to, apart, the, the quality, the improvement of the quality of human capital, which is I think very important. The problem in Papua now is education. I discussed it again with the ambassador here, your ambassador. But Paul, I don't know whether he's Indonesian or Australian, yeah? <laughs> because he's born now, understand about the so I don't want to speak Bahasa next to him anymore, you know? because he understands everything. Uh, he's very, you know, apa, Rajim, you know, very uh, visiting Indonesia. He knows Papua well. So I'm going to, sit, to visit Papua with Ambassador Paul next week, Pak, yeah, on, on Sunday. And he said, I'm allowed. No, you can allow. You can go alone, you can go with me. So either one. 
and she said, okay, we go with you, okay. Then I uh, invited also your uh, your attorney general, why don't you come over to Papua? Oh, yeah, we can. Yeah, you can ask also a member of your cabinet to join us over there. Nothing to hide, you. it's not the time to hide something, you know. Let's work together, make it transparent. If you make some mistake, let's fix the problem, fix the mistake. Now, this economy empowerment, this is, I think, very important. Uh, through the utilization of economy and resource potential uh, existing in Papua, there are so many things can be done over there. But you can imagine, the population of Papua only 3.7 million. While the size of Papua is like three. Oh, Java, three times three three times, times, three three time of Java Island. In Java Island, 120 Oh, 130 million. So this is the complexity of the problem. So way of thinking Japanese. Uh, I'll claim Japanese not what Uldo and Batak, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's different to look at Papua, you know. You know, the budget for Papua this year, nearly 7 million US, billion US dollars to serve 3.7 million. We have to do it rightly. Otherwise, we're going to put money somewhere else on that. Next slide. Look at this one. We're doing this one, I'll give you the copy ebook so that you can copy, you can study, maybe look at liar to be a liar here. No, I'm honest here. So look at this one. We are sincere right now to give the best of the best to the Papuanis. But we still make mistakes. But the, the leader now, there are three of them. I can tell you the problem of the leadership. We have to fix the leadership. We have to focus on that separate thing. Let's move. Now, this is, I think, the budget. Uh, if I may uh, transfer uh, from central government to Papua provinces, this is the data. Look at the numbers. You can search this one. But where the money goes? We're going to audit people, Veronica. This is a problem. The last 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Five years. Five years. The last five years. <coughs> this is the budget. So we're talking about data. We're not talking about uh, filling off. You can check this number, Pa Marcos. Yeah, no. You can check whether I'm, so he's going to see me here, because he's going to accompany me also to Papua. So tell me whether I give you the right number or wrong number. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah, this is also another problem. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Transfer uh, from uh, Central Garden to West Papua, this number. Five years. We see the total. This is five point. Uh, this is billion, yeah. Five point five billion is the, the last five years. To serve only one point two two million. Look at the number. So one point two million people we give five point one billion US dollar. Next slide. Now, if you look at ladies and gentlemen. People keep talking about the free port contribution. The free port contribution is one, 38 trillion. While from the central government, 150 trillion. This is not. But how do we use the money? That's I think the problem. Right now with the holistic program, I'm hoping that we can uh, do much better than before. Now ladies and gentlemen, let's move to the next slide. Uh, there has been no sign of improvement on the, uh, in the HID, HDI rank following the special autonomy. If you look at this now, the autonomy is starting then down, but the gap still like this. We don't want that. We like Ibu Veronica, professor, to narrowing this one. That's our job right now. So we understand. We study on based on this um, based on this data. So then we know where we're going to. So now we going. Uh, we audited already the uh, uh, budget in, in in Papua. So the the purpose of that basically we know from which point we're going to. Uh, otherwise we don't know what kind of mistake that we made before. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to the next slide. Uh, if you look at also the next slide, the holistic uh, uh, solution. Yeah. This is I think yeah holistic solution. Approach. This is what we say: economic empowerment, education, health, infrastructure, diplomacy, diplomacy. We like this one part of the diplomacy. No, we tell you, we brief you. This what we're doing right now in Papua. So make it also because we get some uh, how do you call it 
files uh, information, uh, disinformation about what happened in Papua. They said, hey, Indonesia brutality in Papua. Come on. In Papua is very democratic right now. I don't know. Ibu, can you give uh, your eye? Your... Sorry, Ibu, sorry. Uh. Can you give your... Uh, your uh, Testimony. Uh, confession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> testimony. Ibu, la, testimony. Ibu. Testimony. Ibu. Testimony. Right. Sorry. Yeah. I need a translation. Yeah. Yeah. Translator. Siapa ni tanya? Edo, kamu terima. Yeah. Sadia, Sadia, Sadia. 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 We, the uh, uh, civil social, social society in Papua, yang adalah masyarakat LSM. We are the NGOs, masyarakat adat, and also the uh, adat society, pemuda, and the youth, perempuan, and women. Kami ber, mem, kami uh, ada di dalam satu pertemuan. We are in one meeting. Dan memutuskan untuk memilih beberapa orang. And decided to elect a number of people. Dari para pihak yang saya sebutkan tadi. From the uh, youth organization, women organization, and the other uh, village. Untuk ma untuk masuk dalam tim kerja penanggulangan, tim terpadu penanggulangan. Dugaan pelanggaran HAM di Papua, di tanah Papua. In the task force of uh, human rights issue in Papua. Hal ini oleh karena Presiden Republik Indonesia sangat memperhatikan bagaimana kita harus menanggulangi dugaan pelanggaran HAM khususnya di Papua. This is because President of Indonesia, President Joko Widodo, is very committed on addressing the issues of past human rights abuses in Papua. Dan kami menangkap apa yang disampaikan oleh Menko Polhukam Bapak Luhut. And we understand what has the Coordinating Minister Paulus Panjaitan said. Untuk turut bekerja bersama dalam sistem to collaborate in the system untuk menanggulangi dugaan pelanggaran HAM di tanah Papua. To address issues of Cases of human rights abuses in Papua. Itu mengapa kami berada di sini. That is why we are here. Kami harus berbicara tentang fakta dan data. We have to always talk about facts and data. Oleh karena ini mengenai penanggulangan pelanggaran ham. Because this is to address human rights issues. Kami tidak bekerja oleh karena ditekan oleh. Bapak Menko. Now we work not because we don't need any pressure by the Coordinating Minister. Tetapi kami bekerja sama. Kami harus menyelesaikan apa yang selama ini di di disuarakan oleh para pihak tentang pelanggaran ham di Papua. But because we want to cooperate, because we want to collaborate to address the issues of human rights abuses alleged. By some people in Papua. Papa Menko Polhuka berjanji bahwa sampai akhir tahun ini semua kasus, yaitu ada sebelas kasus yang kami sudah prioritaskan, akan diselesaikan dalam tahun ini dengan prioritas tiga kasus. The Coordinating Minister for Law and Security has pledged his promises to. Resolve eleven cases of human rights abuses in Papua, and five of them, three of them, this year. Mungkin untuk sementara itu yang saya sampaikan, karena bapa akan mempresentasikan. Ini jawapan dari presiden Stephanie. Stephanie from Bulicia. I met her first time like three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, when we started this program, but I didn't pay attention to her. 
Uh, I think, oh, okay, come on, so whatever, you like to say. But I told her, let's work together. Now you can tell whatever you like, but you have to talk based on data, not rumors. Because problem today, too much rumors. I want to see the data. My background, again, as I said to you, I grew up in the military. I experienced the military. I've been touring around the country, Indonesia. So I know what's really going on on the ground. So I'd like to see Indonesia become a peaceful country. Become a, because the potential in Indonesia to be the great nation is a big, it's huge. We can do a lot. This is a rich country. Cannot be, not necessarily depend to any, uh, to any country. Why? We have so many things. We have to be proud to be Indonesian. But what we need today, how do we manage Indonesia to be the great country? Ladies and gentlemen, to uh, conclude my meeting and my presentation here, let me go to the last slide, the last two slides, basically. I would like, this is, I think, the, uh, the people of Anu, the children, kids in Papua, would like to see a uh, built soon uh, boarding school for uh, pre-university students in Papua, in, in uh, Sentani, and also presidential uh, scholarship for Papua. Uh, this morning we discussed it, and the president agreed already last uh, month. Ongoing right now, we plan to send like 200 uh, students every year abroad to do them on further study. And also affirmative scholarship from existing uh, teams that are uh, already ongoing. And uh, I believe that we can enter a new era of Papua. And I believe also with your support, uh, we, are, we can solve the problem. But again, let me uh, finalize with one word, one sentence. If you want to criticize Indonesia, we are happy to receive that critic. But please, give the critic based on data. Not rumors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Butler Hood. There's a great deal of substance in what you presented. You would have seen Marcus and me and even Patubes taking photographs of some of your slides because some of that information was very, very useful to us and also very valuable to hear. Um, uh, voices from Papua, as it were, talking about um, the developments that the government is leading um, in Papua. So now we are able to push back the time a little bit, so we have 15 minutes for um, question and answer, and we'll take the questions in batches of three. I would ask you to be very succinct in your questions, no long statements, please, and um, hopefully we can also get very succinct answers. So, I see a hand up at the back there. I see another one there, Danang, and one more, and Baba here. So, begin with the back with uh, Astari. Yes. Selamat siang, Bapak. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good. My name is Astari. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Terima uh, kasih, Bapak, for your presentation. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, environmental issues. We understand that uh, you've been very passionate about conservation, deforestation, and uh, extinguishing, uh, reducing deforestation and extinguishing forest fires. And we've also um, noticed that Fajokoli has instructed a moratorium on oil palm plantation and mining. And I was wondering if you would mind to speak more on that issue and what is the status of the moratorium? Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes. Thank you. And then, and as a student here. The first question is when do you open Papua for foreign journalists? Because it's useless you speak about the data without open Papua talk to foreign journalists. And and, and secondly, how, how how is your planning for the future professional military? Because the, the, what, what I see the military is not only you, but there is also Kirlan Chen, there is also Kiki Sanakri. So there is the picture of our military. Thank you. My question is to the lady, but the village was up on myself. I have a very specific question. I'm very encouraged with your presentation. Thank you very much. On Ms. Papa's parents, the same. But one thing that I need to confirm and assurance that there won't be any more human rights abuses in this Papua. There no more. There won't be any more human rights abuses in this Papua. The reason why I'm asking is because they have been so many promises before, but yet last month we were having a meeting in London and the 2,000 people have been detained and I'm very surprised. 
when you assure us that they won't be back. Well, I'm happy to have paid. Well, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. Question number one is talking about moratorium uh, kelapa sawit, yeah. palm oil. Yes, indeed, we are planning to do so. I think still in. in. Um, we like, you see, like 55% of the palm oil owned by ownership of the, you know, ordinary people. But the problem, uh, yield of the uh, plantation owned by the uh, by the you know by the small uh, uh, group only like if I'm not mistaken like uh, three tons per hectare while the big plantation like uh, you know big group uh, the yield is around five to six tons per hectare the problem because of the seed and also the fertil uh, fertilizer so what we have planned today we like to replant replanting the old one owned by the by the what call, by the by the farmer, the plasma, the plasma. So if we successful to do so, we believe that we can bring to around five tons per hectare. And immediately, then we can you know bring the our production uh, much bigger than what happened today. In Malaysia, different. In Malaysia, I think average of their plan of their uh, yields around five to six, maybe uh, sorry six to seven. So we have to improve also the performance of our. Uh, uh, palm oil industry and the second question about that uh, well military no more military is easy to answer also the question from uh, Danang no we don't have any plan to uh, put military back to like before no military exists but in their task they have also uh, allowed or used by the government to support police to uh, facing or uh, kind of you know like a terrorist attack, like some other thing, also like a disaster, like what do you call it, uh, you know, uh, like tsunami last time, and like uh, you know, uh, earthquake, something like that. Still allowed to do so, and I don't see that the military can go back like uh, uh, 2000 and uh, the, the era of or the Baru. And about uh, Danas, about journalists, yeah. when the last time you were in Indonesia? Foreign journalist to Papua. Yeah, yeah. When you were last time in Indonesia? I'm from Yeah, I know. Last when? A few months ago. A few months ago. I think we announced already that foreign journalists can go to Papua anytime they like. So it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. Tomorrow and Sunday. Uh, oh, he's not journalist anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're allowed to go there. Spend many. Uh, say some complaint, they said. Why the military is still asking them when they go, or the police, sorry, to go to the highland? Of course, we do want to make sure they are going to the right place. If they arrested by the arrest by the by the OPM, then another big deal, and then they will blame again the security people over there. No, we allow them. There's nothing to hide. I told you already. You go here. And I said, why do you have? We make a mistake. We are not a uh, uh, day one. We are still human being. We can make a mistake, but the the, the 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 one thing that you have to understand the spirit of the government today. We're going to be very transparent. If you make mistake, the military or the police bring them to the court. But if the people, ordinary people, kill the police or kill the military, what are you going to do? Have to be fair. Have to be balanced. That's I think the policy of the government. The professional professional military. The retired, who cares the retired or retired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the active military, I promise you, they're not going to touch about uh, no, the civil uh, uh, things anymore. But human rights, Papa? Uh, I, I don't know, so far I think we, we are very committed. I don't know when I retire, but as long as I'm in, in my job today, and I believe it, same with Pajor Kori, it's not going to happen. But if you ask me whether it is possible happen again over there, yes, I think General Tito can explain that the general, uh, the police instead of the military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third question is uh, the, the third question is inviting me also, you know, to answer a little, a little bit about the human rights issue. So the number of 2,000 uh, politically being detained in, in, in in Papua, I don't think it is really accurate. I've been, I used to be the chief of police in Papua for two years, 2012, 2014. 
So during my time, you know, uh, most of cases related to disregarding whether they are Papuan or non-Papuan living over there, as long as they are breaking law, making committing any crimes, then we have to bring to justice. So justice, you know, being prevailed over there, quite fair. Uh, so uh, with regards to again the number, I don't think really this, is, this one is really accurate. And I would like to tell you something that if there is an allegation of human rights, it must be done and with pin coin only two entities, number one police and number two military. So the chief of police is Papa one today. Where is Papa? Also the power. Oh, he's outside. He's the chief of police in Papua. He's a tough one. All, most of the chief of police in big cities, in Pap Jayapura, for instance, Jeremy Rintoni, Kronitaba, is a tough one. In Wamena, also Papua, Kronitaba. In Monokwari, the capital of West Papua province, uh, Johnny Isil is a tough one. And the paramilitary elements of, of the police in, in Papua, the mobile brigade, Brimok, the commander also a tough one. And with regards to the military, Kodam, yeah. So the chief of staff, number two percent, is also part one. So I, I, I don't think it doesn't make any sense for me that if the police, the part ones, also you know committing human rights against the part one as well. Thanks very much. Maybe you add a little bit about Vinda. <laughs> because you were uh, chief police at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with regards to Vinda, Vinda, uh, he engaged in in both in, in the case, a uh, criminal case in in. Uh, in Papua, in the year 2002, uh, he must have minded the uh, violence attacking the police station in Abukura, killing, yeah, killing, I forgot the name, two or three individuals, three, two or three police officers. So he's the chief of police in Papua, two star general. Yeah, he's also my classmate, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, many men are uh, in our. A legal system is is a culprit behind the attacks of the police force and committing violence, killing uh, people, including police. It is also being part of crimes in our legal system. I'm sure in elsewhere. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no three questions. Uh, Andy, yes, you, and one more question. Third one up the back four. Thank you. Uh, to go straight on the point, uh, the South China Sea, you didn't mention anything uh, about South China Sea, yes, right? so my question is, um, I'm rather uh, pessimistic about the uh, future trends that's ongoing in the South China Sea. The South China Dialogue uh, attested to that, and so my question is, how is the Indonesian government going to anticipate a worsening situation over there? Thank you. Um, my name is Lisa, I'm a PhD student here. Um, I'd like you mentioned about um, Dana Desa, which is um, very strong in um, infrastructure. I'm wondering what your perspective is on the potential of PPJS, the National Health Insurance, in possibly reducing that gap, increasing welfare, and possibly supporting the uh, matters as well. Thank you. And Bob Lair. Bob, are you my classmate? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I haven't seen new agency, no? Not <laughs> exchange for me, anyway. Um, I won't ask you about rumors that you... Don't tell me why, tell me what they like before. So I won't say anything about John Beth's report yesterday that you're going to be challenging the vice president for the next presidential election. Oh. <laughs> come on, <Bob>, come on. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm done, you know. But uh, getting back to policy matters, you uh, talked a lot about drug, the drug issue there. And it's a reality that most of the world hasn't been able to deal with drugs effectively. But what is for sure, and most of the data shows, although the politics haven't caught up, is that a law and enforcement approach doesn't actually work by itself. Uh, and there's too much emphasis placed on uh, the war on drugs in America, for example, and the criminal justice system uh, in, in most Western countries. And I was just wondering whether you've given any thought to looking at better ways of, of, of addressing the drug issue overall. Uh, okay, uh, now, uh, Andy, I think South China Sea, 
been a great pleasure to hear you speak and uh, the information you presented has been very valuable to us. We particularly, we particularly appreciate the candour and often the good humour with which you've presented your information as well. Uh, we know that you come to Australia often and we hope that we will see you again at ANU. You always would be very welcome here, so we hope we see you again. Just before you leave, we have a few gifts that we'd like to present to you.